Instead of focusing on winning arguments, we're teaching the basic fundamentals of sales and marketing and how we can use them to win in the world of politics, teaching you how to meet people where they're at on the issues they care about. Welcome to The Brian Nichols Show. Well, happy Monday there, folks. Brian Nichols here on The Brian Nichols Show. And oh boy, oh boy, you are in tour for, of course, another fun-filled episode. And I am, as always, your humble host. Today, we have a recurring guest. And I'm so excited to have him back on the show. You know him because he talks about finding the why and why people buy Victor Antonio. Welcome back to the Brian Nichols Show. Wow, you actually wanted me back on the show. That's amazing, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. Believe it or not, Victor, not only did I want you back on the show, a lot of people in the audience, I dare say hundreds, uh, wanted you back on the show because I constantly hear now little sneak peek, by the way, if you go back to the original intro of the Brian Nichols Show uh, back uh, last year, that is, um, you were the beginning of the intro. And it was talking about what we're trying to do. We're not trying to uh, you know, go ahead and push a product. We're not trying to push a service or, or a solution, but rather we are trying to help sell change. And uh, people love that. And, and I think people are starting to realize that there is a very similar world between the world of sales in the private sector, but also in the world of selling politics. So that's where I've been focusing. That's I know I've been having a lot of success. And people said, Brian, got to get more people like uh, Victor back in the show. Actually, can we get Victor back in the show? So here we are. And we're going to talk about your new book, which you just wrote, the uh, Mastering the Upsell. And uh, that's where I think we sometimes drop the ball in the world of politics. We'll get somebody on board. They'll get all on board with ideas. And then they just kind of fizzle out. So maybe we can talk about upselling. That doesn't have to be politically focused today, but just across the board. And we can obviously draw the world of politics. But before we get there, Victor, a quick reintroduction, if you would, to the Brian Nichols Show audience. Uh, how, how have you been, number one? And number two, what's been going on in the world of Victor Antonio? Well, I think, you know, one of the nice things I'm seeing is the activity in the world of speaking for me and training, right? So we're starting to see more live events. So people are getting away from virtual. So the calendar is filling up for live events, and I'm super excited about that. Obviously, the release of the new book, Mastering the Upsell in January. Super excited about that as well. Uh, new courses on the Sales Velocity Academy. Super excited about that. And inflation. Not excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> it, no, nobody's excited about inflation. Quantitative easing, two words, two words that can cause a lot of damage. If yeah. only people had trusted the experts, eh, uh, Victor? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it's, um, you know, it's funny because the it, it all impacts sales, right? Everything, I mean, you see today, the it, one of the things that I'm training a lot on is training salespeople on how to have a price increase conversation. So I've been posting stuff online on YouTube uh, because now, you know, you, you got to go back and tell your customers your prices are going up. And how do you have those conversations? And not to digress from, you know, mastering the upsell, but I think it's worth noting that that is one of the biggest things that, that people are asking for now is how do I go back and tell them it's going to cost you more? Yeah. Well, n not only is it going to cost you more, it's going to continue to probably keep costing more. Um, so we're going to have to get comfortable with upselling in the world of the private sector. And frankly, if we're going to want to continue to grow in the, the world of politics, you have to upsell there as well. So let's talk about that, Victor. Mastering the upsell. Now in your book, I correct me if I'm wrong, is it 16 strategies? Yeah, you've outlined 16 strategies that you can go ahead and implement. But before we implement strategies, we have to understand the idea of upselling. So let's dig into this. What is upselling and how does it look in the world of sales so upselling the simplest way to explain upselling versus cross-selling right so if you want a uh, single burger and you go to a double burger that's upsell or a triple burger that's upselling if you want fries with that that's a cross-sell in other words you add something that's not vertically integrated to what you're selling and i started looking at the world of upselling because one of the things uh, i came across a study this is about two years ago when i, I came across a study it was like you can increase your revenue and i have this in the book by up to 30 percent by just focusing on existing clients. So that, that's a number. That's a metric to take away. 30% by focusing on existing clients. The other thing, that, the other aha moment I had, and this was after I wrote the book, just kind of validated. I was talking to a company, large energy company. Uh, they do power supplies for like, you know, cellular towers, you know, anything that has to do with wireless communications. And after, during the, after the pandemic, after 2021, going into 2022, one of the conversations we had was, how are your sales? And he says, look, Victor, is two things are happening right now. Our sales are down 10 percent. 
he said. But I think they're not spending a lot of money on the road, so forth and so on. So my cost of sales has literally gone down. And that reinforced why upselling is a great strategy, especially now. Because if you're selling to your existing clients, there is no sales cycle, right? So there's time saving there. Uh, in terms of access to the actual decision makers, well, you already sold to them, so you have access. But the fascinating part was, that the cost of sales in general are going down. Therefore, why not go and sell to your existing clients? Even virtually, that can be done. Let's talk about the cost of, or the, I'm sorry, the customer acquisition cost. Because you have a, a chapter there as you start things off. You talk about there's a the, the customer acquisition mm -hmm. cost versus the LTV, the lifetime value. What does that look like? And why is that important when we're talking about upselling? Yeah. Well, first of all, let me back up because I started the whole story with the Acre of Diamonds stories, right? Yeah. The Acre of Diamonds story is is a story. It, it, you can look it up online. It's basically a story where a farmer who lives in Africa is told about diamond mines, and he says, "I'm going to sell my farm and go get you know to go find these diamonds so I can just live forever and have a legacy after me." And he winds up finding no diamonds and throws himself off the cliff. How tragic, right? And so. The, the, the guy who bought the actual farm discovers these big black rocks in the backyard. And it turns out these were actual diamonds. In other words, they were diamond in their rough form. And the, the, the back, I'll, I'll just say the back of the house was filled along the creek with all these black rocks, which turned out to be diamonds. Now, what's interesting is that the original farmer didn't know what diamonds really looked like. He only saw them in their final stages, all polished up and pretty. So first of all, he didn't recognize that he had acres of diamonds in his backyard, so to speak. And I, I love that analogy because upselling, if you have an existing customer base, is like an acres of diamond. In other words, you have acres of diamonds, customers who will buy more from you if you just realize that they're back there ready to buy. Having said that, the cost of acquisition, the client acquisition cost is how much does it take you? How much time, more specifically, money does it take you? What does it cost you acquire a new client? And if your cost of acquisition cost is, you know, is, is high, then again, upselling will drive that cost down. Now, also customer lifetime value. Now, the customer lifetime value is if you buy from me the first time, Brian, how long are you going to continue to buy from me? In the book, I talk about, I think Starbucks has a 20-year measurement for customer lifetime value. In other words, you start buying Starbucks, typically the customer stays with them for 20 years, right? So now two numbers we need to know. What does it cost to acquire a client? And if I acquire the client, what are they going to buy over a given period of time? That's their customer lifetime value. Now, if your customer acquisition cost is lower than your customer lifetime value, that's always a good deal, right? Because it costs you, you know, X amount, but you got X plus amount over the next so many years. So I think those are two variables to keep in mind. And how does it tie, in, tie into upselling? Well, again, I'm trying to drive your cost of acquisition costs down. And one of the best ways of doing that, again, I'm repeating myself, is to go after existing clients. It, I think we, and you're focusing on this, which I, I like, because we don't think about too often the, the aspect of lowering the, the actual cost of going out. I mean, I led a sales development team for three years and I look back and you know you look at the main costs, a lot of it's the time, the energy and the effort of actually going out and prospecting. So to your point, if you can go ahead and eliminate that and you already have people who are not just know who you are, what they know, like, and trust you already, just seems like a common sense place to start. Now, to begin that conversation, it can be a little uncomfortable. I, I see that a lot where business owners say, hey, I've already built this strong relationship by making the, you know, the, the, the build of the value. I showed how I differentiate and I solve problems and I asked for the sale and they said, yes, but I feel uncomfortable asking for more. Don't I come across as greedy, Victor? Well, no, again, we talked about this last time, Brian, the, the job of the salesperson is to sell value. So if somebody questions that what they're selling us, do you mean I should go back and sell them more? No, we don't go back and sell more. We go back and help more. We add more value to what we've already sold. So, you know, delete that statement. You know, not you, Brian, but just whoever <laughs> has that statement, just, you know, delete that thing because it makes no sense. If you're selling something that's worthwhile, why not keep selling them more of it if it's helping their business grow? Value for value, baby. Value for value. Talk about the propensity to buy. The propensity to buy, it's, it's, you know, again, it's, it's, there's people who are willing to pay what you have to offer. And I'll give you a broad stroke of what I, what I like about propensity to buy without um, diving too deep into it. The propensity to buy is figuring out who's willing to buy from you. And this is kind of obvious, right? And again, I'm going to tie back to upselling, keep it real strict in, in that channel. And that is 
the propensity to buy is very high when you're selling to existing clients. So why not again exercise that? Why not go after that existing business? And as I go through the different strategies, which I'm sure we'll talk about a few of those, you'll begin to see that if people are willing to buy, there is a propensity to buy, then why not sell to them? But again, we don't sell, we sell value. And if they can make more money, reduce their costs, increase revenue, expand their market share, you know the deal, uh, then why not do it? Keep selling. So let's go into some of these uh, these strategies. And the first one, it, it struck me funny, the, the freemium to premium, I laughed. And you did have a line that I, I have to read out loud because it's mm. so true. And, and you see this in, in the idea of the cost of being free. Free is never free. There is always, always a trade-off. Is that not true in life? in politics, in business, everything, but, everything. everywhere, right? But let's talk about that, the free uh, freemium to premium. How does that work in the world of upsells? Oh my God, we're, we're victims of this, like, especially with all these subscriptions we have with all these SaaS products, right? Uh, I use, I think I use Dropbox as a perfect example of you know freemium to premium. They'll give you like, I don't know, 10 gig, I forgot what it is, 50 gig uh, for free. What happens is you start loading up, you know, you start uploading stuff in the Dropbox and then you realize you run out of capacity and there's different strategies that companies use to kind of say, okay, you need to buy more. And so then all of a sudden you just got to go to premium. So you got to actually buy something. So again, you start out free, but you wind up buying. And it reminded me of the Costco model, which I used, I think, in the, in the actual book where you go to Costco and they give you a sample of food, hoping that you'll buy, you know, the actual product. No different. A lot of these software companies, these SaaS companies, you know, software as a service companies will say, hey, try our software, use it for a while. And if you like it, great. If not, you know, that's fine, but it's free. What's not free? Because once you start loading it up, all of a sudden, it's, it's very difficult for you to get off that platform. And I, I talk about that's called sunk cost. You've invested so much in the Facebook, for example. Uh, and I think that's the one I use as far as, uh, you know, if it's free, you're the product. I think that's the line I use. If, if the product's free, you're the product. And so, you know, a lot of people can't take down their Facebook account because they've invested so much. Instagram, whatever, Snapchat, you've put so much content on there that letting go becomes that hard. But again, if you want to use more of the services, for example, back to Dropbox, now I need more memory, more storage rather. So guess what? I'm paying 99. No, I'm paying $129 a year. So I went from free to $129 a year. Well done, Dropbox. Well done. Surprise, surprise, <laughs> surprise. I got you. Uh, no, don't worry. I, I'm I, Everybody, I think, listening is nodding in agreement like, oh, yeah, I, I have at least one or two subscriptions that are just like that. So, And maybe it leads to with the next uh, strategy that we, we focus on, decision fatigue. And we see this in the oh. world of politics, Victor. Oh, my gosh. Decision fatigue totally is well. rampant. Um, but let's talk about this. And you tell a story of one of your customers. It's Michael Moore. Not that Michael Moore, folks. Different Michael Moore. A successful pool <laughs> owner. I didn't think about it. <laughs> I didn't think about it. Yeah, not that Michael Moore. <laughs> and uh, let me see if I can recall the numbers off the top of my head. I know the story in general, but he had sold a pool, uh, and I think it was like eighty thousand dollars, right? He sold the pool eighty thousand dollars, and then he upsold the person. I think another forty thousand dollars, so like a fifty percent upgrade. So now he closed the deal at one hundred and twenty. Uh, double check my numbers. And he's super happy. And this is a true story. I'm talking to this guy. Yeah, we were like in Guatemala doing an event. And he's telling me this story. Uh, and I, and then he says, he goes, then I found out like a month or two later that he bought like $30,000 worth of patio furniture from one of my competitors. And I'm like, why didn't I grab that $30,000 at the same time? And I said to him, I said, well, we went back and forth. I said, no, no. I said, people get tired of making decisions. And so I actually looked up, you know, uh, like getting tired of making decisions or something. And there, sure enough, there's something called decision fatigue, which people get tired of making decisions. They're like, and we've all been through that, right, Brian? You're like, you know, you're there, like in a car, you're buying a house or whatever, you're buying some, you know, for a new bathroom. You're like, you get to a point where you go, you know what? Okay, that's it. That's all. Uh, let's just stop right here. Let's just go ahead and sign the deal. Let's get this done. Let's get this started. But then after you close that deal, right? You give it another, let's say, a week, two weeks, three weeks, whatever the time period is, then you're ready to make new decisions. And knowing that is what Michael Moore missed. He could have just closed the deal at 120 and then maybe gone back two or three weeks later after the person is ready to make new decisions, after they've recovered from the fatigue, like being tired, and then actually sold them. So now I'm advocating to clients that if you sold somebody and you can tell that they tapped out on making decisions, what you should include as part of your process is when do we go back for another bite at the apple, so to speak, to add more value. And by the way, that's by the way, this example is a good example of what that uh, person said earlier about 
you know, going back and selling them more. Notice that the person this time went and asked for more. Right. Perfect example of selling value, don't keep buying. Yeah. Well, and and I mean, just to take a little quick segue to my day job. I mean, I work in the world of not just cybersecurity and voice and data and WAN architecture, but just in general business technology. So if you go in and you're saying, okay, I have a voice solution I'm selling today, you make the sale and then you go on your happy way. That rhyme didn't mean to that to happen. Yeah. Um, but then you move forward, right? And you yeah. don't go back and say, hey, by the way, have you looked at things for your sock and SIM solutions? Have you done penetration testing? They are yeah. likely actively looking for it, and they frankly might not know that you offer that service. So being able to tell them and, and quite frankly, educate, enlighten, and inform them, that will, in its own nature, help lead them to see, oh, wow, Victor can help me in other areas. I didn't know he could help me. And uh, I, I think it's funny. You mentioned a uh, bathroom project in your last response. Well, that's actually where I was going to in number 11, which was uh, reframing value. You talk about a bathroom project that you and your wife were doing. And one of the, the ladies at Lowe's caught you off guard when you were asking for paint because it wasn't that the paint that she uh, talked about or the paint rather that you brought to her, it wasn't in stock, but rather she said you should maybe not get that paint. Why was that, Victor? Yeah, I, <laughs> well, it was interesting because you know, and, and I want to highlight this because what that person did to us was basically, first of all, they told us, no, you know, you don't want to do that. And they positioned themselves as an expert because then they went on to explain why for a little bit more you should buy Y paint. And, and I love that example because what clients want today, and let's tie this into decision fatigue also, Brian. Clients have so much information in front of them that they're having a hard time making a buying decision. So there's decision fatigue and then there's decision apathy because they're like, I, I, I can't decide, right? Because they don't want to have any buyer's regret. And what the market wants today, you tell me if I'm wrong, Brian, because uh, if you're in the business of selling cybersecurity, uh, you know, IT, you know, solution in the background, I know you understand what I'm about to say. What people want is for you to help them, uh, you know, uh, Brett Adamson used the word make sense of what's in front of them because they're confused because they, they got too many options. So our job, much like that lady, the paint example, her job was to clarify what we really needed or what we really wanted. And she wasn't afraid to do that. And so I'll throw this question back at you. Do you find that customers today really want you to kind of not hold their hand, but guide them to maybe the right solution? Oh, absolutely. Because they're terrified of what happens if they make the wrong decision. Yes. Um, we've seen this. This blew me away. I was sitting down with one of the uh, the CEOs of our vendor uh, for a cybersecurity vendor we work with uh, out in the East Coast this past weekend. And we're sitting down and he goes, you know, what's crazy, Brian, is that last year you saw, I think the number was 110 percent increase in ransomware and cybersecurity attacks. Mm -hmm. And yet when you look at those companies that were hit, 75 percent of them had an existing endpoint managed uh, uh, MDR solution so that they already had something in place that was supposed to protect them and it didn't work. So mm. that speaks to a lot of people are looking to get away from, okay, I check my box to, okay, I need to make sure that I'm not just checking the box. I need to make sure that I'm putting cybersecurity not as a, a product, but rather as a service, as a solution. So yes. now when they're going out and they're saying, I need help doing this, they're looking for someone who's not pushing a product, but rather in, in the case that I find myself in being able to have a conversation and say, hey, let's talk about what are the top areas of concern. Let's dig into what you've done in the past, what's worked, what hasn't worked, what fears you have, what compliances you might have to address, all these different things that are on their plate. And then to be able to find the right solution for them that's going to meet their needs. And that is such a... A much, it's such a better conversation. It's a much more refreshing conversation because they, they're they now in the process of not trying to find a product to solve that fear, but now they're in the, the mentality of, oh, this person has my genuine best interests in mind. There and just am I, yeah, and along the way, you're going to naturally find that the, the sale just kind of happens. It just kind of makes sense. It, it really, it, it's a natural progression. And, you know, yeah. uh, I was trying to define, I don't know what, I was, what, what mental exercise I was going through, but I was trying to define the word trust 
because we if we can develop trust with the customer, we can accelerate the sales process. And I think I was trying to figure out how do you shorten the sales cycle? And trust is the best lubricant to closing a deal, right? I should put a shirt on that. Trust is the best <laughs> lubricant to closing a deal. Yeah, shit, that's a good line. Okay, anyway, back to the point. So I, I've defined trust and it has three variables. I want to see if it passes the Brian Nichols whiff test, okay? For you to build trust, the first thing you have to do is it's the empathy piece and you have to take the customer's point of view. We'll call that, you got to take the customer's point of view, really empathize what they're going through. Number two, you got to also, also I'll say plus, so point of view plus, you have to position yourself as a subject matter expert. Like they go, ah, this guy, gal knows what they're talking about, right? I believe them. But the third component, ooh, the big one you just mentioned. And the third one, so we got point of view, Plus, I'll call it SME, subject matter expert. Plus, I call it the BIM, B-I-I-M. You have to have their best interest in mind. In other words, when the customer senses that you really are concerned about them, you're not trying to reach into their pockets to grab more money or wallet share. What you're trying to do is, look, I have your best interest in mind. And the best example of this is, uh, I think an example in the book, I talk about uh, a guy where I take my Volvo to that's now 22 years old, right? His name is James, and James has mastered the art, but he does this out of, out of caring and for his customers. He's mastered the art of downselling. He's the guy that will tell me, no, you don't need that. You don't need to do this, but that right there, you need to do, and we're going to do it. I'm like, whoa, and I realized that this guy cares more about my car than I do. Now, think about that. The guy cares more about my car than I do, and when you feel that, you're like, you trust him. Over the years, he's literally called me looking at your car. Here's what I thought, thought, thought. You don't need to do that. Put that on your radar, though. But right here, we're going to do this. The only question I have is, how much is that going to cost me? And usually I go, ouch. Okay, but fix it. And all of a sudden, that's what customers want. Take their point of view. Be a subject matter expert. Demonstrate that you know what you're talking about and keep their best interest in mind. Yep. And and, and I always joke that like sales and marketing are, are like ugly step sisters. But at the same point in time, they are, and they're super important, but they're, they are separate, right? So you should know when, you're, when we're having these conversations, who your target market is, and sure. you should already be speaking to that person. So you're speaking their language, you know what their, their fears are, you know what's driving them, who they are as an individual, what their, their your, we say the buyer persona, what that looks like. Um, you, you really want to make sure that you're, you're going through this sales process in that mentality with that person and not doing it after the fact <laughs> when you're sitting down with a person you're like oh wow you're not qualified you're not the person who makes decisions yeah. and by the way if you actually get to the point where you're sitting down with someone and you're talking about these issues you need to start back maybe going back and focusing on and this is the last point i want to focusing on make it a process so let's make it real and this is where in cybersecurity solutions business technology solutions it gets tough because people get afraid of changing the status quo, upsetting that proverbial apple cart, having something happen that goes mm -hmm. wrong, and then them be the ones that have to go through the blame. So let's talk about this. Let's remedy those fears of that one CEO who's concerned that upselling is going to just destroy his entire client base. Let's make it a process, Victor. How does that look like? And let's make it real. You know, it, it's I, I'm blown away that people would think that upselling is going to upset the Apple car. I, I, I just I don't understand. You know, I mean? I'm like my brain has a hard time just socializing that thought. It's one of those. Well, what, do you, what do you mean? If you're just trying to help, like when you were talking about your example about the customer that you're selling cybersecurity to, then you added services around like penetration tests and things of that nature. Right. You're trying to help them make sure that, as you pointed out, that their endpoints are protected. And so that's not really, I mean, it is upselling, but it's also trying to help the customer. I know I'm beating the drum on this because if you understand that you're selling value, then you don't have a problem going back to the well. Because again, if you come to me, Brian, and you sell me something and I start using it, I go works. And then you show it to my door and say, Victor, I got something else that works. You want to look at it? What do you think I'm going to say? I'm going to go, yeah, what do you got? You know, it's like a drug dealer, right? It's like, yeah, what do you got now? What do you got? Because, I mean, that's the mentality of sales. If you really believe in your product, you'll think that way. So I'm led to believe that people who are afraid of upselling don't believe in the value of what they're selling. And what they do think is that what I'm selling isn't worth the price that I'm asking my clients for. So there is a, a bad belief system that a lot of salespeople have. So uh, I don't think it's upsetting the Apple cart. I'm thinking penetration rate. 
if I can use your phrase, or <laughs> penetration for wallet share, right? How do we get more out of that client? I don't know if I answered your question, but I did want to add something to your statement earlier about marketing and sales. I'm going to make a controversial statement. I think I made it last time. Is that I think I used to laugh at marketing, like, what do they do? Do they even yep. have a job, right? And today I really believe that marketing has a bigger role. And I think uh, I just saw there is a study that just came out by McKinsey. This, this will blow your mind. This is like a 2022. We're talking, this just came out like last month. So they asked B2B buyers, you know, how much would you buy online? Like what's your, what's the value that you're willing to buy online? And the first price point was $50,000, right? Would you buy something worth $50,000 online? And I think the number was 65, 67% says, yeah, I would buy something that's $50,000 online. Boom. I'm like, whoa, that's a big number. And I think I'm being conservative. I think it's higher, but I know it was at least 65. And then they asked, what about $500,000? Half a million. 20% said they would buy something at a half a million online. I don't know about you, but that's a mind blower. This is what's happened. The, the pandemic has created this. I mean, we were on our way to a digital transformation, kind of maybe going with a little 45 degree trajectory, but the pandemic said go 90 degrees. Let's get there. And all of a sudden you're starting to see these big deals. I mean, people are buying houses online now. You know, you've seen this, right? Without seeing them, right? Just going off pictures, they're buying cars. So the market is shifting. Uh, and, and I just wanted to highlight that because I think that's important that people are now on their own customer journey, finding what they want and they're willing to pay more online without actually meeting with the salesperson. That is not to say, Brian, because I know somebody's going to hit the panic button. You're going to say, oh my God, does that mean B2B sales is over? No. I think when you look at the spectrum of selling, uh, simple to complex, within the medium to complex, you'll always have a need for B2B salespeople who are subject matter experts that will always have a role if they know their product and their market and their client. Yep. I, I mean, like everything in life, the only constant is change. And I think we're going to see, and we are seeing, frankly, that marketing is taking on more of the, if you will, the, the, the prospecting role, but it's not prospecting. It's more so a better understanding of who the target market is. And then with that, being able to go after those individuals more precisely. I mean, you mentioned Facebook. If you're not paying for the product, you are the product. Well, quite literally in Facebook's case, your data is the product. And that's in many cases how marketing has been able to go after you specifically when you have a product that you're like, I just talked about that with my wife. Why am I getting an ad for that? But right. I actually do need this. And that right there, the actually, I do need this. That's a conversation to your point that more and more people are willing to say, okay, well, I'm just going to go ahead and buy it online. And when you see what, what you're seeing with the subject matter experts, that role is turning more into that consultative, you know, let me help address the fear yeah. that you can't have answers when you frequently asked questions. By the way, that, that right there, I mean, you hit the nail right on the proverbial head. The we're, we're going back. It's almost like history repeats itself. Back in the 1970s, a guy by the name of Mac Hannon wrote a book, Consultative Selling. We're going back to that again. I'm telling you, we're going back to consultative selling. And it's interesting because I'm working with a client now, and I'm literally reading consultative selling, and I'm reading one called um, The Discipline of Market Leaders, which came out, I think, in the late 80s, early 90s. Now I think it was like 1991. So that's what, 30 years ago? And if you read this book, Brian, you're like, this could have been written yesterday <laughs> because it's talking about what's happening today. You would think with all this technology, people can make decisions on their own, but no, the complexity in your business, specifically cybersecurity, I can only imagine the, 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 the number of permutations solutions that you can provide your customers. So now you have to, it's all bespoke, right? You have to customize it. Yep. And so again, I think people who, again, take the customer's point of view, take, have their best interests in mind, but our subject matter experts on top of that are going to be the winning salespeople, you know, moving forward. Well, folks, if you have found the, uh, the tips, the strategies, very useful. Well, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Uh, did you know you can find this awesome book available over on Amazon.com? Yes, the rumor is true. I will make sure I include the links in the show notes. But if, for you audio listener, yes, the book is Mastering the Upsell. And uh, Victor, as always, we want folks to go ahead if they want to not only uh, learn more about you, but go ahead and give you a shout. Where can they go ahead and do so? 
Victor Antonio. Just go victorantonio.com at Victor Antonio. I'm all over the place. Uh, but check out the book. The book is, first of all, it's reasonably priced. Uh, but what I love about the book is that it's chock full. And you went through it, Brian, so you can uh, attest this. It's tactics, real stuff that you can use in the real world. It's very light on theory in terms of like fluffy stories, you know, and anecdotes. It's really like, here's the strategy. Here's how you can implement. And it's almost like a buffet a la carte. Take what you want, leave what you don't want. Yeah. Is, isn't that one of your favorite lines, the, the Bruce Lee, the Bruce Lee quote? Yeah. yeah. Absorb what is useful. Discard what is not. Then add what is uniquely yours. Damn, there you, you know go. Well, Damn it, you know me well, Brian. You know me well. <laughs> It's not like I listen to your podcast or anything, Victor. I don't know. Um, and, and you know what? I, I think, and I'll wrap with this too, because this is the first episode I've, I've done since I was over on Tim Pool's show. Um, and we had a great conversation. We talked about, oh my goodness, all sorts of fun things. Make sure Who you all, is all, yeah. Tim Pool? Who's Tim, Tim Pool? Oh man. Okay. <laughs> Folks, please email Victor who Tim Pool is. No, Tim Pool, he's one of the, the top uh, podcasters, top YouTubers in the country. Oh, I think. Yeah. Now, now I feel like really dumb and it's all recorded. Huh? <laughs> no, <laughs> but uh, no, he, he talks to a very different audience. And in my audience, I mean, yes, we have some political folks here and a lot of business folks and sales folks. And I was able to you know bridge that world, the, the politics, bridge the world of sales and to bring that perspective to his audience. And hopefully we can help change the conversation. And I think, the the part there in that Bruce, Bruce Lee quote, the, the uniquely yours, what is uniquely yours? That's the uniquely yours approach we're taking here at the show. I know over on your program and what you're doing, focusing on upselling and talking about, I mean, goodness, who wants to go out and talk actively about how we can talk about increasing prices on customers? And yet, Victor, it's an important conversation that you know that the people are out there having right now. So let's go ahead and show them how to do it. So we're having the important conversations, being unique in doing so. And I think we're showing that there is a very, very real demand for doing things differently. But in many cases, a lot of the ways that we're doing things differently is just doing the things that work. And those things that work happen to be some of the things that have been around for quite a long time. So I know I'm keeping you longer than we had promised, but Victor, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, with that being said, folks, please do me a favor. I will include all the links in the show notes. If you enjoyed the episode, well, number one, please obviously share today's episode with family and friends. But number two, please go ahead, give Victor a, a follow. And also please go ahead and pick up your copy of Mastering the Upsell by the one and only Victor Antonio. But with that being said, it's Brian Nichols signing off here on The Brian Nichols Show. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for listening to The Brian Nichols Show. Find more episodes at briannicholsshow.com.